What's going on, guys? So today, I'm going to do a class overview of Stamina Templar. This is far better than just your typical build video. While there is nothing inherently wrong with build videos, I think that they have their place. They give a short and concise video format on what a person is running and their ideas. But oftentimes, they can't get into everything because it just takes way too long. I think encompassing all aspects of a class and a build rather than just focusing on one setup is better because not every build is for everyone. People have different preferences and play styles. I think this type of video can give you guys the tools, the knowledge, and the understanding of the core mechanics of how Stamina Templar is meant to be played and how it can be played effectively. This video is for new and veteran players looking to play Stamina Templar, but are unsure on where to start or what to do. I go over your race, skill lines, strengths and weaknesses of the class, gear options, and much, much more. At the time of recording this video, we are in flames of ambition during the no proc PvP in Cyrodiil. I will briefly touch on setups and builds that you guys can run for that, but this video is meant for a more longevity over several patches. So I will talk about proc sets, basically what you guys can run right now in Imperial City and Battlegrounds. So now that we got that long intro out of the way, I do want to mention one more thing. So I do have a Patreon. If you guys enjoy my work and want to support me further, the Patreon is by far the best way. You guys can get some awesome perks as well, like early access to my videos, unreleased gameplay, personalized build help from me, and much more. If you guys are interested in that, then definitely check out the Patreon link in the description below. And let's get right into the video. So to start things off, I think the best place to start is to look at the best races, since this is the first option that you guys have when you're making a new character. So in my personal opinion, the three best races are Imperial, Orc, and Khajiit. Now I'm going to explain all of the races and let you know the pros and the cons and let you make the best decision for you. So for me personally, I prefer Imperial. So we get 2000 health, 2000 stamina, and 6% cost reduction to all of our abilities. So this includes magicka skills, stamina skills, and ultimates. So the the cost reduction is the main reason why I picked Imperial. So I use two Magicka skills that cost a hefty amount and being toppling charge from my main stun to knock people on the ground and is my gap closer. And then I have Cleanse, which is removing negative effects and debuffs from me and it costs quite a bit of magic. So having that 6% cost reduction really helps with a magic sustain. And being a stamina build, your Magicka is not as good as it would be for a magic build. So I kind of have to adapt my build to alleviate the troubles from a magic sustain and imperial definitely helps with that the only really drawbacks for being an imperial is the fact that it's behind a paywall you do have to have the digital imperial edition upgrade to be able to play the race so for me i've had the imperial edition since the launch of the game so it didn't cost me any extra money but for newer players i really don't think that imperial edition is really that worth it unless you already have it or just want the mount in general or have the extra cash to spend i think for newer players trying to just have fun in the game you don't have to be an imperial i don't think imperial is is pay to win at all but i definitely think that it, it does fit in a certain play style the best and at least that's just how i prefer to play so it is up to you guys. If you want to purchase it, you guys can. But at the end of the day, I really don't think it is that worth it. So next we have Orc. I definitely think this is another solid race as well. So Orcs get 1,000 stamina, 1,000 health. When they deal damage, they get 2,125 health. And this effect can occur once every 4 seconds. So for their other passive, they get 258 weapon and spell damage. They also get 12% cause reduction to their sprint and 10% sprint speed. So in my opinion, if you're going to be playing a heavy armor stamina Templar, then Orc is probably the best option for you for damage because of the extra 258 that you would get from your race. They also get a lot of speed, which can counteract the slowness of heavy armor. They also get the extra healing, which makes them a lot beefier, that extra 2.1k healing whenever they deal damage every four seconds. Stamina Templars deal damage on cooldown. They're going to proc that just every single time it can proc. So you're going to get a lot of healing from that and be a beefier Templar race. And for my final recommendation, we have Khajiit. So Khajiits get 100 health recovery, 85 stamina and magic recovery, 915 health, magic, and stamina. And then they get 12% critical damage and critical healing. So in my opinion, I think Khajiit is one of the best races for newer players to be. As a newer player, you guys don't have access to a lot of DLCs, dungeons, or chapters. So why would you want to invest $40 or $50 to get Malakath when you don't even know if you're going to be playing ESO tomorrow? You could be playing Fortnite, you could be playing 2K, you could be playing Call of Duty. So why would you want to invest that much money into something that you're unsure about? So this is why I recommend Khajiit. You can be a Magicka spec, you could be a Stamina spec, you can be a tank. Now they may, they may not be best in slot, 
but they allow for versatility for newer players to change their mind and change the build. So they're not stuck with a race that is only good for stamina or only good for magic. They can basically be anything they want to be. And also with end game PVP, this allows versatility. So you're not basically forced to run Malakath since Khajiits get the 12% critical damage. Malakath is really unusable for a Khajiit, at least in my opinion. And you could run a crit damage build or run something different, run something unique that not a lot of people run. So now that we got through the best races, now we're going to check out the strengths and weaknesses of Stamina Templar. So the first strength, in my opinion, is going to be Extended Ritual. This skill right here cleanses you from five harmful effects. So this includes Dots, this includes Major Breach, this includes basically anything that does any harmful effect on you. This can get rid of five of those effects on you immediately and it does a healing over time around you every two seconds for 24 seconds. And it can allow your allies to purge. Uh, if they're in the synergy area and can cleanse harmful effects from them as well so this skill right here is probably one of the best defensive skills in the game so this skill is just so solid getting rid of five negative effects is so powerful in pvp you're going to get snipe spammed you're going to get heal debuffed and getting rid of those can really help you in the fight so now we're going to check out the unique passives of templar so this is really pairs well with khajiit to get the 10 percent extra critical damage you also have the spear wall which gives you minor protection whenever you hit any of these Aegic Spear abilities, which you're going to hit jabs often. So you're going to have 5% damage reduction. You then have Burning Light, which hits like an absolute truck. With how many Aegic Spear abilities we are using, you're going to be proccing this very, very often. So whenever you deal damage with an Aegic Spear ability four times in rapid succession, you deal 4.1k physical damage or magic damage, whatever is higher, and there is no cooldown on this. So if you hit a jab and then you have Crescent Sleep ticking, there's no cooldown, so you can proc this every single time you hit somebody with four Age of Experience abilities. This will proc guaranteed. There's no percentage chance anymore. This is very, very strong, and I think this is going slept on on a lot of Templars. Next, we have this Balanced Warrior. This increases your weapon damage by 6%, which scales very, very well on a stamina build. I mean, 6% is quite a bit with all the additional weapon damage we have. And then finally, we have Sacred Ground. So while we're inside of our Extended Ritual or Rune Focus, we get minor mending, increasing our healing done by 8%. So this provides a lot of tankiness and a lot of healing power on this Templar. So ne the next strength about Stamina Templar is going to be Repentance. Not a lot of Templars really use this skill much anymore. Uh, it, it is definitely very difficult to find bar space on your build, but I definitely think this is really worth it now with the spec that we are running. So this allows us to, you know, kind of run lower sustain. So we're going to run a little bit low on Stamina here before we... Um, hit this ad right here and kill him. So whenever somebody's dead on the ground, like an ad, a player, or whatever, and you hit Repentance, you get healed, and you get a chunk of stamina back. So you get 3k stamina on every dead body. So this can give you, you know, two dead bodies, 6k stamina. Uh, it's just going to heal you for so much. It, it heals your allies in the area. But not only that, but we get the minor fortitude, minor endurance, and minor intellect while we have this slotted. So on our back bar, we gain 15% more all of all of our recoveries. Definitely, this really helps your magic sustain. This helps your stamina sustain. This just helps everything. This stacks with major um, intellect and basically it tries that potion. So you're getting 15% on, on your back bar plus the 30%. So this is going to scale very, very, very well. Next we have, so next we have our ultimate Crescent Sweep. Um, this thing hits so hard. This thing will slap people in the face and does so much damage. Like I explained earlier with the burning light so if we have crescent sweep ticking we have a top wind charge and then we're hitting jabs on top of that our burning lights gonna be proccing often but this pulsates around you and it just does so much damage so it's it just it's so cheap for being an imperial it costs 67 ultimate i think it costs 72 at any other race this ultimate is just so powerful and i think this is the better morph the other morph increases the damage of your light attacks which is okay so by having the 60% increased damage to enemies hit in front of me, it's just so strong uh, and it just hits so hard. So next we're going to talk about channel focus. Now this skill is very, very underrated on a stamina Templar, but you could use either morph of this. I like the magical one. I'll kind of explain later why I use it. But either of these morphs costs literally no resources. This cost me a thousand magic. The stamina one would probably cost me, you know, five, six, seven hundred. Um, the magical one gives me magic back and the stamina one's going to give you stamina back. The recovery on here is calculated 
every one second and it gives you 240 recovery so how recovery is calculated on your character sheet it says when in combat you recover 764 magic every two seconds so your recoveries are every two seconds the skill on channel focus is every second so we have to multiply that times two so we're getting 480 match recovery every two seconds so after about six seconds of this you're going to have all the cost of the skill back and then you're just going to be gaining free resources at that point you also get the extra resistances while you're standing in it so this skill is just so strong uh, if you compare this to other skills like a warden skill or a magic dragonite skill there's cost like 3,000 magic and they don't get any extra resources back out of it. Wardens get minor protection, but we get minor protection from jabs. So, so this legit just costs nothing and it really helps stamina Templar uh, sustain all of their resources. So now that we've gone through the race and through the strengths and weaknesses of the class, now you've decided to play stamina Templar and you're like, what do I need to do now? So you're level one and you're trying to figure out, you know, what you should do. So I recommend let's go through the passives first and let's talk about which ones you, you should get so at max level you want to have all of your class passives you want to make sure this is all level 50 you're going to get your two-handed passives if you're using a two-handed weapon one-handed shield passives if you're using one hand shield dual wield if you're using dual wield bow if you're using bow and destro staff if you're using destro staff so these are all of the ones that you're really going to use this is rather unique with the destro staff i'll explain that later but you really won't be using resto staff on stamina templar i really doubt it if you're using light armor, make sure you get all the passives. Medium armor, make sure you have all the medium armor passives. If you're using heavy, use all the heavy passives. Uh, it is beneficial to, to slot the passives if you have at least one piece because it does give you, for example, if we had a one piece of light armor, we would get reduced effectiveness of snares. We would get cost reduction of sprint. We would get magic recovery. We would, we would get reduced cost of our magic skills. So make sure you have those passives as you level up. Now, they're really not important at low level, but once you get in game and you have enough skill points, you definitely want to make sure you have these passives in. So whenever you first create your character, you want to join the Fighter's Guild, the Mage's Guild, and the Undaunted. Now, I don't have the Mage's Guild on here because I didn't pick it up and I don't need it personally. I already have a Magic Templar and I don't plan on making this a Magic Templar. So, so basically, how to find the Fighter's Guild when you first create your character is just look up where to join the Fighter's Guild in Glenumbra or whatever area you're at. And then it'll show you online. To level up the Fighter's Guild after you have joined it is basically just killing Undead and Daedra. That's the only way to level it up. If you didn't join the Fighter's Guild before you joined, you would not gain any of that XP. So it would be a waste. So make sure you join this before you get started. Mage's Guild, you get this for picking up books. Uh, I don't need it because I'm not going to be playing a Magic Templar. So you can get it if you want. If you're going to be playing a... Maybe if you want to try a Magic Templar later. Um, it's just really up to you. So, and lastly, for the Undaunted pick this up so you basically level this up three ways just completing dungeons doing public dungeons or doing dailies the undaunted dailies that's the best way to get undaunted points doing the no death hard mode and speed runs on the veteran dungeons are also a very very good way to get it if you have a good team and you're not brand new you could probably get undaunted 10 um you know within a few days but if you're a newer player it's going to be a slow grind to get this up so, but you really only need it like i think level like nine i think to get both of these passives they're definitely worth it so you definitely want to get this and then next once you hit level 10 you want to go to cyrodiil and get your assault and support passives um get resolving vigor asap and then get the continuous attack you could do battlegrounds to you know get some ap um basically once you hit level 10 just to get this because you definitely want to have resolving vigor to heal yourself especially for you know trying to level up and then obviously as you level up, you want to get your Imperial passives or your racial passives, whatever you pick. And then finally, uh, passives for crafting. You want to make sure you level up your alchemy. This is by far the most important as you can just create potions for yourself and you can get the medicinal use passive that increases the effectiveness of your potions. So if we didn't have this passive, we would not get as much duration of the potion. So this gives us... Uh, basically 47.3 seconds of all of our tri-stat recoveries now if we didn't have this this would be like down to like 30 some 30 something seconds so definitely make sure you get that so when you first start out you want to make sure you have biting jabs rust ceremony and sunfire uh, these are going to be the three main skills you're going to have at first but obviously you're not going to use these at end game after you get enough skill points you really want to get uppercut and then that'll be you know your, your fourth skill here 
and then whatever back bar skill you use for example if you use one hand and shield so slap puncture on on your front bar so you're not gonna be able to use puncture but what it's gonna allow you to do is get xp of one hand and shield on your front bar so we have a skill from each skill line so we'll have a one hand and shield ability we'll have a two-handed weapon ability we have a storm restoring light dawn's wrath and adric spear now for ultimate wise you can really pick adric spear uh, crescent sweep or nova but that's all preference whatever you like to use Crescent will definitely be the best for damage, but it's all preference. So obviously, as you keep leveling up, you want to, you know, change this skill, like, to Power of the Light instead of Sunfire. So you grab that. And then for Restoring Light, you'll want to definitely level up Repentance. You could, you know, put Channel Focus here instead, you know, as you get higher level. But this just makes it to where everything levels up at a steady pace and nothing is left behind. Uh, and you don't have to go back and level just one one or two things just to level that up So that's a quick little tip now. We're gonna talk about what skills you need to end game So you need crescent sweep biting jabs binding javelin top lane charge You need power of the light And in the restoring light tree we need repentance extended ritual and channel focus You could use either morph of channel focus. I prefer this one though Two-handed weapons you want to get executioner and rally you could also get the two-handed weapon ultimate if you'd like to so if you use one hand and shield at all, you want to grab Puncture, you want to get Shield Wall. I definitely need to level this up, but I don't really use Sword and Board that much. You want to get uh, Power Bash, or morph this to Reverb Bash, uh, if you want to use this as a main stun. It definitely is good for dueling, uh, instead of using Toppling Charge or Biting Javelin, at least in my opinion. Dual Wield, you want to make sure you get Blood Craze and Quick Cloak. Those are the two main um, skills here. Bow, you really want to just focus on poison injection um, or even arrow spray. This is very, very disgusting and annoying to go against. Um, so if you want to use a bow, then you could definitely level these two skills up. Desert Staff, um, Elemental Drain is the main one here. You can use this on a back bar for your Stamina Templar and slap on Elemental Drain and get the extra penetration and the extra magic sustain, which I did use this at the beginning when I first created my Stamina Templar. Uh, it definitely is unique and it's definitely kind of weird but this is definitely very very strong to give you 6k pen um, it is a unique play style um, for medium armor where you're going to use more or less shuffle or elude i think shuffle is the best morph uh, at least for stamina templar for me um let's keep going here fighters guild definitely want to grab Dawnbreaker and a camouflage hunter if you want stygic then get this if not it's okay um, resolving Vigor, you definitely want this. You want Caltrops as well. Um, and that is all of the skills, guys. So that is all the skills you really need to level up. Now, it really depends on how you want to play your character, whether you want to run two-handed weapon and a bow, or two-handed weapon and dual wield, or, or 2 h sword and board. Um, it's basically just going to dictate what skills you use. But this is just a rough draft on kind of how you're going to use them. So now let's talk about what skills I use for PvP and what I would recommend you to use so this is for a dual wield on our back bar and a 2h on our front bar setup so we have executioner this is your main execute this kills people when they get low uh, next we have our rally this gives us major brutality this gives us minor endurance and it gives us uh, a big heal after the duration lasts so we it lasts for 20 seconds so the longer this goes down to one second the bigger the heal we get so if we hit it right now we get 8.4k heal from rally if we hit it now that was a crit my bad so 5.3 right there. Wait a little bit. Hopefully this doesn't crit. We'll hit it at 10 seconds. Yeah, there. 10.2. So that was like double the heal from the rally for basically just letting it last for 5 more seconds. So the closer it gets to 0, the bigger the heal you get. That's kind of how that skill works. But once it runs out, um, it'll use it, but you will have to reapply it. So if we hit it here, we get a 15.8k. So... That's how big the heal gets. So it's basically, I guess it's 33% bigger. 15% bigger every second. So up to 300%. So next we have Power of the Light. Let's go down here real fast. Hopefully they don't die. Okay. So Power of the Light, basically just put it on the enemy right here. And this does a little beam above their head. They get Minor Breach. And any of the damage you deal is copied into the burst. So the more damage you deal, the more damage Power of the Light does up to a certain am amount. So... 20% of the damage you deal to them for 6 seconds, 
um, gets copied, and the maximum copy damage is 17,000. Um, so it's not, it doesn't seem like a lot, but this definitely can apply a lot of pressure, and it's very, very subtle on the damage. So this is all preference. Toppling Charge or Javelin, I prefer Toppling Charge for my spec and build, like I've explained, you know, several times. But Toppling Charge, what this does is it puts you right in front of them, knocks them on the ground, and you can go right into the jabs, right? It applies off balance, and it does magic damage, and it costs me magic. If you want to use Javelin, you guys can. Um, it has a range, um, but I, I don't like it because I have to run back, to, I have to run to them. So I do this, and then I hit Javelin, and I'm not right in the way I need to be to hit my jab. So, it definitely is good, though, if you're going around a wall or something like this, or trying to, you know, get somebody off of you and stun them off of you. It's definitely good, but I don't really like it. I would rather have my top in charge any day of the week versus Javelin. That's just me personally, but it is definitely good regardless. It does ignore the resistances, so whatever the resistances are, this thing just goes right through it. So... So that is all preference. So next we have biting jabs. So this skill is very difficult to use. So basically this goes in an eight by six meter radius in front of you and it pokes in a cone. So when you're using this skill, uh, it hits the closest person with the most damage, but the other people around take less reduced damage. So each strike reduces the movement speed of the enemy by 40% for one second. And applying this gives you major savagery, increasing your weapon crit for eight seconds. So this skill has a bunch of buffs. Um, very good for trying to land it. So whenever you use jabs, um, you never really want to use it like just like this. Uh, it is very difficult to land, especially if somebody knows what they're doing. So rule of thumb though is whenever you're really using this skill, you want to top and charge, and then you want to walk around them. So you kind of want to put them in the middle, um, and just you know kind of walk in a circle around them. I know it may make people dizzy. But this is honestly the most effective and easiest way to land it. So top and charge, jabs, and walk in a circle around them. Okay. Definitely the easiest way to land it. That's why I recommended using it on R1. Because if you use it on square, you can't move your character's screen and hit the skill at the same time. So that is by far the best way to land it. Just going to come from experience trying to figure out how the character moves. So for example, is trying to dodge it by walking through me because that's honestly the best way to counter it. What you can do is top and charge and then back up with your jabs. So this forces them only in one direction and that forces them this way. And then you can dictate on how you move your character or whether you, you know whether you charge forward like this or if you want to pull, pull back some more. Um, but jabs is very versatile, but it does take a lot of a learning curve on how to actually use them effectively um, and what you should do. But this is by far the best way just to walk around them like that. So now I'm going to teach you guys the combo of Stamina Templar and kind of how you want to use your skills. So obviously make sure your buffs are up. That's the main thing. Um, first, before you ever do a combo, you want to make sure you have your defensive buffs up. So you'll typically want to go Power of the Light, Toppling Charge, right into a light attack, into jabs. That's bread and butter, easy. Obviously I know it's an ad, but if you're you know fighting other people and they take a lot of damage from just that alone, then you'll want to go into you know more jabs, but that's really not going to kill a lot of people. What really really nukes people a lot is power of the light, toppling charge, crescent, right into jabs at that point. Then you have all of your burning light going to be proccing. You really want to go offensive with the jabs, and you'll have your power of the light kicking in there in a second. You have the crescent sweep ticking, and just all of that just absolutely melts people. That is just the basic combo. There's going to be more advanced combos that you really can't describe unless you actually see the example on kind of what's going on. But you just remember jabs. You can walk with them while you use them. You can turn around. Um, oh, if you're snared. So say, for example, you are talent on this little, little piece of grass here and you're facing this way. You can turn your camera around and then jab this direction. I don't know if you guys know that or not, but if you're talent and you're facing this way, you can turn your camera this way and then jab. That's very, very good for PvP. So that is really the offensive combo. It's not very hard to understand. Power of the Light, Topping Charge, Crescent, Jabs. And then when they get low, you can go right for Execute really quickly and then secure the kill. So now for our defensive skills and kind of how they work. So really just plug in whatever setup you're running. So if you're using a Sword and Board, you're probably going to use Puncture here. If you're using a Bow, you may be using Poison Injection. But if you're using dual wield, I prefer quick cloak. 
So this is just my specific build. So I have Quick Cloak here. This provides me with major evasion, reducing my damage taken from area of effect attacks by 20%. This also gives me uh, major expedition. And so with the dual wield that I'm running, I have the perfected dual wield, which gives me the 103 stamina recovery. And when I deal damage with Blade Cloak, it grants me for two seconds, 6% damage increase and a 6% damage reduction. So this is why I really like this on Stamina Templar. It gives you speed. Now, if you're doing open world Cyrodiil PvP or anything like that, obviously you may want to use Shuffle or something different. But this is just what I use for, for BGs. So next we have Cleanse. I've already explained this skill some. Uh, this skill just removes negative effects from you. So typically when you kill somebody and you want to use Repentance, what you'll do... So we'll kill this ad real fast. So you'll go Repentance and then Roll Dodge. And this will heal you and mitigate damage if it's coming at you. Like, for example, if you're getting sniped and you don't roll dodge with repentance, you're going to get a heal, you're going to get some stamina back, and you're basically your dodge roll may be free just from the repentance sustain alone. So that is that is a very, very good thing to do if there's a few people that's dead. And you roll dodge repentance like that. You're going to get stamina back while also mitigating damage. So that's a little, little trick there. Channel focus, I've explained this skill, you know, a little bit before but this gives you the armor buff um just make sure it's up 24 7 pretty much uh obviously you want to keep your buffs up as much as possible and then finally we got resolving vigor this is your main healing over time this remember how i was just talking about repentance whenever you roll dodge and use it so you can re resolving vigor and roll dodge this causes you to get two ticks of vigor before you take any damage and uh your roll dodge mitigates you know all of the damage you would take other than if it's like in an aoe or if it's a channel ability like Radiant Oppression or the Vatron Staff, you can't dodge that. But you can dodge, you know, like single target attacks like Surprise Attack, Force Pulse, Light Attacks, stuff like that. So, uh, ultimate wise, this is really preference. I like Temporal Guard, um, but you can use uh, the Rite of Passage ultimate here. You could use um, any ultimate you'd like. But those are the two main ones I would really suggest using. Because all the other ones really aren't that great. Now what you could do is you could use Barrier here to get some more magic as a sustain if you wanted to. It's going to give you 10%. But I think just Temporal Guards is better just for the when I block and I can you know get a little bit of damage shield. So what is like a healing combo for Templar? I get a lot of people that's asking me this and it's very very hard to really explain. So you want to just make sure you have your rally up all the time anyways. So it really that's really ready to go as soon as you need it. So basically... How you really heal yourself on Templar is you want to resolve in Vigor and you want to get cover and then you could like bar swap into a rally for a big chunk heal. Basically, nine times out of ten, what really saves you is the resolving Vigor because this thing always heals you over time. So what you can do is you can resolve in Vigor and then go right into offensive. Okay, you're always going to have that resolving Vigor tick healing you over time. And then if you kill them, you can repent into their body, get a little bit of a burst heal, heal up with rally and then go right back into offensive so really the the main combo of how to try to stay alive is just make sure you have your resolving vigor and your cleanse down that's really the best way to stay alive make sure you have that minor mending down too to give you that big healing um and kind of you know use your use your rally when you need to when you need a little bit of a burst heal to top yourself off um but you're mainly your heals are just going to be resolving vigor that's really going to be the main thing that's going to really help you and just overall damage mitigation. Just make sure your armor buff's down. Make sure you have your quick cloak to reduce your damage taken from area of effect attacks. That sort of thing. That's really the best advice I can do to give you to how to, you know, play defensively and heal yourself. Other than just, you know, how to kite in line of sight and stuff like that. So now let me go through some of the sets on Stamina Up Templar that I recommend. So, for the first set, we're going to talk about Stoon. Now, the reason why I use Top and Charge is to proc the Stoon. So what this does... Is for the two piece it gives me weapon and spell damage three piece of penetration the four piece weapon and spell damage so a great two three four piece and the five piece when i deal damage to an enemy who is off balance i gain 5126 physical and spell penetration for 10 seconds so the thing that makes this set so powerful is this a buff applies to me this is not a debuff on the enemy this is a buff to me so this will stack with major breach and i'll just basically get 5k penetration just after procking off balance it's just, just a very very strong set this set is just so powerful so typically stoon is a set that you only run on your front bar so what is really a front bar so a front bar is where your damaging skills are so as you see here i got my jabs on my 2h bar got my cc got my ultimate right 
So we have Stoon 2H. This counts as two pieces. So we have the chest, we have the boots, and we have the ring. So this gives us one piece, two piece, three piece, and the two handed weapon is four and the fifth piece. So this only allows us to proc this on the front bar. If we swap bars, we only have the three piece of Stoon here, which is okay because we're only using Toppling Charge on our front bar to knock them off balance, and then we proc the Stoon right away. So there's there are several sets like this that are very, very similar. For example, there's Briarheart. This is gonna work the same exact way on how we use Stoon, but this obviously applies a different type of buff. So we get Weapon Crit, Max Stamina, Weapon Crit. When you deal critical damage, you increase your weapon damage by 450 for 10 seconds. While this effect is active, your critical strikes will heal you for 355 health. This effect can occur once every 15 seconds. So this works just like Stoon does in the fact that it only would really recommend using this on the front bar. You can use this on the back bar because it's only whenever you deal critical damage. But for, for the most part, just to keep it up consistently, it's ideal to run it on the front bar. So next we have 7th Legion. So this set right here, it gives us weapon damage, health recovery, weapon critical. When you cast an ability that increases your physical and spell resistance, you gain 341 weapon damage and 341 health recovery for 15 seconds. This effect can occur once every 15 seconds. So what does this set sound like? This sounds like a very, very good back bar set. Since we use our channel focus to give us armor buff, and this will proc the 7th Legion, this is a very, very strong back bar set. Back bar, just similar to front bar, but this is where your defensive skills are. It's where we have our repentance, our resolving vigor, our armor buff, our cleanse, and our buff, right? So 7th Legion is very, very good on a stamina Templar. Um, I think a good setup would be 7th Legion on the back bar with Briarheart on the front bar. Um, that's always a good option. It's very, very solid and very strong because you're getting the critical from here, the two and the four piece. And then Seventh Legion also gives you a weapon crit on the four piece. So that will stack pretty nicely on your back bar to give you a ton of crit and it'll increase your crit chance so you can proc your uh, Briarheart more often. So next, let's take a look at Clever Alchemist. This set is similar to Seven Legion and the fact that you'll be using this on your back bar more than likely. So we have a two-piece, three-piece health, a four-piece weapon and spell damage, and the five-piece when you drink a potion during combat, you feel a rush of energy increasing your weapon and spell damage by 675 for 20 seconds. So again, this set is just so powerful, giving you 675 weapon damage. That is absolutely bonkers. Uh, this set is very, very strong on the back bar. So similar to 7th Legion, you could do a back bar of Clever Alchemist with a front bar Briarheart. You could 5-piece this just on your body and then run like Mythic items. You could 5-piece Clever Alchemist and then use like a different set like Arena Weapons with Malakath and something like that if you wanted to. There's several different options for Clever Alchemist. But for the most part, it's either used on the five pieces on both bars or it's just used on the back bar. So next, we're going to look at Eternal Vigor. This set is just so powerful. This gives us mag recovery, stamina recovery, health recovery, and then the five piece of max health. Also, we gain stamina and magic recovery while our health is above 50%. And we gain health recovery when our health is below 50%. So if you're not an Imperial, then this is probably one of the best sets for a Templar, specifically for a Stamina Templar. To get all that magic sustain, we can really use a lot of toppling charges with that sustain. So an ideal setup with this on a Templar, now this is all preference really, it just depends on how you wanna build your character. But what you could do, you could run like a Malakath ring here and then run two pieces of Eternal Vigor on the necklace and the ring. You could then go chest and legs and feet of Eternal Vigor. So that's gonna give you five pieces on both bars. And then you can run another set like Stoon on the shoulders, the waist, and the hands. That's going to give you three pieces. And then run the 2H Maul of Stoon, okay? And then you'll have like a Helmet of Blood Spawn or a Helmet of Balor or something like that to give you weapon damage or stamina recovery, whatever you prefer. So you have five Eternal Vigor and then you have Stoon on the front bar. And this still gives you access to the BRP Dual Wield if you want to run this on the back bar, which I would recommend for this single reason right here. So... Since we have Stoon right here on the shoulders, the waist, the hands, and the 2H, all those pieces are going to be medium, and then we have the head medium. That's going to be 4 medium, and then the Eternal Vigor is all heavy, so it's going to be 3 heavy and 4 medium, right? We cannot use Shuffle unless we have 5 pieces of medium, which is okay. Um, with a lot of the changes to the armor now, that we get 2% of weapon damage per piece, so we would be at 8% weapon damage instead of 10%, which is alright, not, not too bad. 
but we also get a lot of the tankiness and a lot of the sustain extra health for being in heavy armor so it's pretty good offset honestly because we get all that magic sustain for being with eternal vigor and we can use a lot of skills then so so then you can get your quick cloak and your brp dual wield to give you the extra damage reduction from aoe attacks and you could spam your cleanses and you can spam your uh, top wing charge pretty consistently uh with eternal vigor so that is just a very very small example of how to set up your stamina templar now that doesn't have to be your build at all uh, I, I personally like the setup with Briarheart and 7th Legion. So Briarheart on the front bar, 7th Legion on the back bar. And then you could run like a mythic item, like the Ring of the Wild Hunt. Uh, you could run Tonal if you'd like to, to get a little bit more sustain. There's just so many options on Stamina Templar that you could run that are very, very solid. So if I were a newer player, I think a good setup would be for me personally. So this really is universal to basically any build per se. But what you could do is you could go with... Clever Alchemist 2H, and then Clever Alchemist Dual Wield, Sword and Board, Bow, whatever you really want to run here. Run a Clever Alchemist Belt, Hands, and Feet, so that's going to be five pieces on both bars. Then we're going to run Eternal Vigor on the chest and the legs, and then the three jewelry. So then we have room for a monster set. Pick pick what you'd like here, Bloodspawn, Balor, kind of whatever you have. Um, and that's just a very, very solid setup. You're going to get the weapon damage from the potion. You're going to have enough magic sustain to, you know, hit your cleanse. Um, you can really do whatever. You can even do something like Stoon instead of Clever Alchemist. It's really all preference. Any of the sets that I explained are very, very solid. Just keep in mind, if they require you to deal critical damage and you're using Malakath, they will not proc and they won't work because you cannot deal critical damage with Malakath. So there are just a few options that you guys can use to set up your Stamina Templar for PvP. So what would I run for no proc PvP? So if, if I was doing no proc PvP, I would run Shackle Breaker. I run five pieces of this. And then for my other set, I would use a five piece of Impregnable. So this is going to allow you to not run the critical resistance CP passive and allow you to run other things in the, in the CP system. If I was doing no proc PvP, I would probably be a Khajiit with this setup and run a lot into crit damage and then make sure you have your crit chance up. This is just what I would run. This is going to allow you to be tanky. And you're also going to have some magic sustain through Shackle Breaker and through a Khajiit. As for your monster set, I would use a One Piece Krog right here. This is going to give you physical penetration. Since, you know, most of the time, if we're running dual wield and 2H, we don't have access to major breach. So we would run this Krogs here to give us a little bit of penetration. Now, if you ran Sword on Board, you could possibly try a One Piece Domihas or a One Piece Balor. Uh, if you're obviously using Major Breach. And then for our other set, we're going to run a One Piece Slime Crawl to give us some more critical chance. I feel like this is going to be the best as a Khajiit. You could do double crit chance here if you'd like to. Um, but I think having that little bit of extra physical pen is very, very valuable. I'm really starting to like penetration on a stamina build. It's slept on a lot. People just think just stack weapon damage, weapon damage, weapon damage. Well, it works. But I think physical pen is very underrated. For at least stamina builds. For magic builds, it's pretty much a must. Um, and I'm starting to believe that for stamina build is very, very solid as well. So that was what I would run for my no prop PvP build. Um, I would run a mace, a 2H mace. I feel like that's going to be the best. Just again, to stack that penetration. Um, and tra for enchants, I would run tri stack glyphs on the big pieces like the head, chest, and legs. And on the small pieces, I would run stamina glyphs. If you craft your jewelry in shackle breaker, you could probably go two infused and one, one swift. I really like one swift for this patch. Um, especially medium armor just to get a little bit faster but I would do five medium and two heavy if I could just to just to make sure if you don't use a if you don't use blade cloak if you use like a bow or something on the back bar you don't have to go recraft anything um, to not be able to run shuffle so that's why I would do five medium and two heavy just to give you a lot of weapon damage as well um, but that's what I would run personally if I was doing no proc PvP I don't really do a lot of no proc seared although I, I tried it at first I liked it um, but I just felt like I was getting zerg down all the time. Battlegrounds are just much more fun for me, in my opinion. But that's what I was run for no prop PvP. So now we're going to go over our pots and potions and our consumables, what we use to eat, what our food is. So for my alchemy potions, I typically will use um, Essence of Immovability pots. So that's like Mountain Flower and Wormwood right here. So this gives a movability, it gives health, and it gives stamina. That's one of the potions I use a lot. 
other than that, the only other potion I'm going to use is going to be the Tristat potion. Um, this is to sustain your magic or some. If you feel like it's going low and you don't need to move ability potion, then it's going to be Bug Loss, Columbine, and Mountain Flower. This gives Tristat health, magic, and stamina. So it'll, you know, give you all of your resources. Those are the two potions I use personally. And I feel like those are the best for Templar in general. Food-wise, I use Artem Takeaway Broth. This food is expensive right now. So if you don't have enough money to buy it, you could run the Lava Foot Soup and Salt Rice. Um, it gives, like, max stamina and stamina recovery. It just doesn't give health. Let me see if I have any in the bank. So... This gives you uh, stamina and stamina recovery. You would have to invest some points into health, though, to get this, um, to get your health pool a little bit higher. Um, I would definitely do that. You want to make sure you have enough health. So, like, so you want to make sure you have your health right around 26k, 27k health. Um, you won't have the health recovery, which kind of sucks for not running our TAM. But I feel like it is the most viable option for being, you know, don't having a lot of money to buy our TAM. Um, you could always use Dubious Cam and Throne Food. I don't have that, but it's just a weaker version of our TAM. And it doesn't give the health recovery. So I would just personally use the... I would personally just use Lava Foot. That's just my opinion. So now we're going to go over my poisons. I personally like the Double Dot Poisons on this Stamina Templar. So the reason why I use them is I'm using Dual Wield. So the enchantments will be halved in general anyways. So I feel like I get the most benefit from my poisons. And the reason why I use the poisons for Dual Wield is I use Blade Cloak or Quick Cloak. And this hits in the area of effect around me within 5 meters every 2 seconds. So this hits multiple people, not just one, not just two. But anybody that's with, within 5 meters around me every 2 seconds, it procs on my front bar as well. So it's like a pre-buff. And then like if I'm on this bar, it'll it'll hit people as well. So, uh, even if I use Blood Craze, I would definitely still use Double Dot Poisons because it is a dot. Um, but if I was using like Sword and Board on the back bar, I don't know if I would run Poisons. For this reason only, is none of this... All of these skills are single target, and they only hit one time. So it's not a dot, it's just going to proc once, and you you may get more benefit from using a enchantment rather than poison, because enchantments are 100% guaranteed to proc. Poisons only have a 20% chance on any you know ability you use, and if you're not light attacking on that barrel often, if you're not doing any damage with any skills, it's really not going to proc your poisons enough anyways. So, so that's just something. I would really recommend if you're using like a bow or if you're using uh, 2H on the back bar or if you're using Destro Staff, um, then poisons are still good, but also enchantments are as good as well. So it's really personal preference uh, for 2H weapons. The enchantments are double value at that point. So if you're using like a Berserker Glyph, like that increases your punch. Let me see if I have one on here, like this right here for the 7th Legion bow. Now it is infused, so that will increase the potency of the enchantment. Um, but it's really all preference on what you want to use. You can't go wrong with double dot poisons though, but you know, it's all personal preference. So now let's talk about traits and enchantments and what I suggest to run. So for me personally, I really like a sharpened maul here. I really was kind of, you know, at the time when I was looking at the PTS, I was like, why would anybody want to run a sharpened maul? I mean, that's going to give you a ton of penetration, but you're not going to get a lot of weapon damage from it. Well, since we got the 1,000 weapon and spell damage added to our character on basic, just being level 50, um, we really get a lot of weapon damage from that, and it scales very, very well with Infused. And I feel like Sharpened and with the Maul is just so deadly right now. You can run a 2-8 Sharpened Greatsword if you'd like to get a little bit of weapon damage and get a little bit of penetration from the Sharpened trait, but that is really up to you. I really don't like a Nurnhode Greatsword. I think that's you know kind of a waste. It's double dipping way too much into the weapon damage. Um, if you have a lot of penetration, then I think it's okay. But if you don't have you know an 11k pen, I feel like it's not worth it. For the enchantment wise, we run the shock damage enchant. This is the best in my opinion. It procs the minor vulnerability. I've talked about this in my Q and A series, um, but you know that's just my opinion. I like the shock damage enchant. We've already talked about my poisons uh, and enchantments for the back bar and stuff. So now let's get into the traits and enchantments I would run on my gear. So on my big pieces, the chest, I would use a tri stack glyph like I am using. So trait wise on my gear, I really, really like five end pen, one reinforced and like one piece well fitted. I feel like that's very, very solid. Um, it gives you a broad amount of extra resistances from your chest. Now your chest, if it's heavy armor, run this reinforced, you won't regret it. It gives the most armor value out of any armor piece you have. 
and then I like M pin on everything else except for like um, whatever piece I have well fitted. I really like well fitted just at least one. Um, it gives you a broad amount of you know cost reduction. It gives you a little bit of tankiness, and it, you get the impenetrable trade as well. Um, now, if you're running impregnable, I would still use this just to stack that critical resistance, since it is so much more valuable this patch than it has been in previous patches. Since we could get it from the Chemby Point system. Glyph wise, uh, I like stamina on the small pieces. That's just what I would recommend. Jewelry is really you know preference and what you need for your build. So your jewelry glyphs are really up to you. Um, it really just depends on your build and your spec. If you're running like Briarheart in 7th Legion with a tonal necklace and you're like a Khajiit with the crit damage minus stone, you may want to run one stamina recovery here. So if you're using my build with the Stunes and the Essence Thief, then you could just probably run all three weapon damage and slap on the Serpent Munda stone. But if you're using like Stune and Eternal Vigor, you could maybe go the Warrior Munda stone. It really all depends on your build and what you're running and you could run all three weapon damage because Eternal Vigor just gives you so much sustain. Uh, it really all depends on what you feel like you need. If you want to run One Piece Blood Spawn, it's really all you know adjustable and interchangeable depending on what you need. But that's what I would recommend for traits and enchantments for your gear. Now this is obviously broad, like I explained. I give you a few scenarios, but I feel like this is the best for overall sense of what you should run. So now let's get into the champion point system. So many of you guys are now aware of this, but these are called slotables and these are called passives. And these are called subcategories. So for my slotables that I'm going to use, so this is for my Stoon and Essence Thief build with Malakath. So if you're using this in, you know, Imperial City, right? So I would use Untamed Aggression. I would use Botting Aura. I would use Duelist Rebuff. And then I would use the Critical Resistance, the Resilience. This is what I would personally use. So if I was in no proc PvP, what would my passives be? So I would use this Botting Aura. I would use Duelist Rebuff. And I would have Fighting Finesse. I would take this out of the Resilience. Because if you're using the Impregnable, then you don't need the extra Critical Resistance from there. And you could use the Critical Damage and Critical Healing. And then you'd have Untamed Aggression. So, that's what I would personally use. I would, I would be a Khajiit uh, in that scenario. But that's just me personally. That's what I would do. So, passive-wise, you want to go into, you know, put some points in the Tireless Discipline. And then come up here and get your damage. Get this maxed out ASAP. And then when it come down here to your damage mitigation, put 10 points in here, then max out Hardy, and then max out Elemental Aegis, and then leave maybe 10, 20 points in here, not many more. And then you want to go towards your Eldritch Insight, and then get some more into Blessed. Now, if you are in PvP, uh, in no proc, then you probably want to max this out as soon as possible. But if you're using Malakath and stuff like that, then you probably could like leave this off until the end. Um, but that's just my recommendation. So that is really all for the blue tree. For the red tree, this is all preference. I'm still tinkering around with this. This probably is not what I'm going to run. In game, I'm still messing with this. But I've been doing a lot of, you know, no CP PvP. So I really haven't had to look at this too much. But for my slaughterables, I have Unchained. I have Rejuvenation. I have this Survival Instincts. And I have Juggernaut. Now, this is what I like. I've been messing around with this stuff. And uh, I think this this thing's low-key underrated. Um, you definitely want Unchained to give you some stamina sustain. Um, Rejuvenation is nice for tri-stat recovery. And Juggernaut gives you just overall less damage taken. Um, Passive-wise, you want to go from um, the Tumbling. And you want to get the Defiance. And then you want to come up here. Only put 10 points in here. The reason why is this reduces the duration of elemental status effects on you. And then this has... While you have a stats effect on you, your core combat skills, that's going to be block, roll dodge, and CC break, I think. But I definitely 100% know what's block and roll dodge, right? Um, if you reduce the duration of those effects on you by this CP passive, then you get less benefit from this. So, in an ideal world, you would not want to have any points into here, and you want to come up through here and get this one and then invest into it. So, you don't have to have any points into here whatsoever. But... Uh, that's in an ideal world. You want to have max out Hero's Vigor. You want to come over here to Hasty. Max these out. Um, Tireless Guardian is the next must. And then everything else after that is really what points you have left. Um, it, they're really irrelevant. Like, this is probably the best one out of all of these. Just to make sure you can block fat, like as you're walking. Um, but that's all preference. So, that is all for the red tree. Green tree is really irrelevant. Um, you want to come up here through Wanderer and get Steadfast Enchantment. Max this out. Get Rationer, get Liquid Efficiency, get Steed's Blessing, put those on your slaughterables. And then you want to come up through here, 
to get gifted rider. So your so your slotables are gonna be gifted rider, rationer, liquid efficiency, and seeds blessing. Those are the best for PvP. Um, and make sure you get this break fall as well. This is very very important. Just reduce your damage from fall damage. Um, but these are the one I have for like when I'm doing BGs, and you don't have champion points anyways in general. So my slotables are. Treasure Hunter to get the chest, and then Master Gatherer to, to get resources, and then Plentiful Harvest, and then Seeds Blessing. This is what I use for farming. Um, I mean, I'm waiting in, waiting in a queue and just chilling. Um, but this is what I use personally. So next, I have like a little low-key thing that I want to put like a little Easter egg in the video. So if you guys made it this far, for the first 10 people who typed in Ocula Overload, I'm going to give them 50k. So basically, uh, yeah, I definitely wanted to give this a try. So when the enemy has a status effect on them, they violently explode for 2.2k damage. This is going to go up to 4.4k, um, and it is oblivion damage. So this is going to be area of effect. This thing looks nasty. Uh, I definitely want to give this a try. If I was to run this, I would drop the untamed aggression for this, um, just to give this a try. I definitely want to see how this works. But uh, yeah, if you guys type in Ocula Overload in the comment section, I will give the first 10 people 50,000 gold. This is only on PS4 NA. Um, it's free gold, so I just want to see who watches my whole entire video. So that is all for the champion point system. Um, I feel like that one and the survival instincts are pretty low key. Uh, but I definitely do like the new CP system. It is unique and it really conforms to your play style and your build. That's what I like about it. But that's all for the champion point system. Alright, so now we are at the last section of the video, Munda Stone. So what Munda Stone should you run on Stamina Templar? It really just depends on your build. Um, if you're running like a crit damage build and a crit chance, you may want to try the Thief. Um, but if you're running like high sustain and you just want damage and you're running like Malakath, for example, you probably want to go with the Warrior. So if you're using like Eternal Vigor, then you probably want to go the Warrior. If you're running something like Briarheart and like 7th Legion, you could try the Thief. You could try uh, the Shadow even. That's a very good Munda Stone. I definitely like that with a Khajiit. Uh, that would probably be what I would run first. Is I would run like a Khajiit with the Shadow Mundus to give you critical damage. So this one is one right here is a serpent. This is what I run on my stamina templar build when I run my essence thief and stun. I really really like having the extra sustain for no CP. Now if you're doing CP PvP, you can maybe drop this for the warrior, drop this for crit chance, really whatever you want. Um, I really wouldn't recommend any of these right here. The lover could be an option though. I have not tried the lover. If you're running like a high penetration and you're running like stuns with a like great sword, nerd home great sword, you can maybe try the lover. It could be an option to give you a lot more penetration. Um, the Lord is really trash. The Lady could be decent. Um, I've tried this on some magic builds. I have not tried this on stamina builds. Um, I know some people that run the Lady with an Orc instead of running a Nord. That could be an option. Um, Atronach, if you really want the magic sustain and you have enough stamina sustain, then the Atronach could be good. Like, you know how I run the channel focus from my Stamplar. It's always an option. Um, you could try the Atronach instead of using that morph. Uh, and then the Apprentice is really trash. So what are the three best Munda Stones? I think for Stamina Templar, the Serpent is a good one. The Shadow is a good one if you're using Khajiit. And then the Warrior is probably the, the next one. They're not in particular order. It just really just depends on what you need for your build and what you really want to try. But those are the three best Munda Stones in my opinion. So, you guys made it to the end of the video. This was very long. It took me a lot of time to make. Uh, and I hope this really helped you guys. I really wanted this to be all inclusive of everything and I didn't want to try to leave anything out. I'm sure I did. I'm only human. Uh, but if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me in the comment section below. I'll try to help you as best as I can. But that is it for the video, guys. I want to say happy Easter and God bless all. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.